There is never any ending to Paris, and the memory of each person who has lived in it differs from that of any other. We always return to it no matter who we were or how it was changed or with what difficulties or ease it could be reached. Paris was always worth it, and received return for whatever you brought to it. But this is how Paris was in early days when we were very poor and very happy. Ernest Hemingway, A Movable Feast Hemingway would immortalize his time in Paris in the book, A Movable Feast. He came to Paris with his wife Hadley to work as a foreign correspondent for the Toronto Daily Star. Here he wrote, drank, loved and loathed. He loathed Gertrude Stein, loved James Joyce, Ezra Pound, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Joe Moreau and Picasso. He was the lost generation. A term created by the very person a term he created by the very person he loathed and loved, Gertrude Stein. Later, Hemingway would use it in the epigraph for his 1926 novel, The Sun Rises. Quote, you are all a lost generation, end quote. Paris was an inexpensive place to live in 1921, but most importantly, it was a place where interesting people could be found. Living in a small walk-up in the Latin Quarter, he befriended the gatekeeper of modernism in Paris, Gertrude Stein. She was his mentor and godmother to his son Jack. She introduced him to expatriate artists and writers, the very ones he would be called in later years with tender endearment. Stein would not be a part of these memories. A decades-long quarrel would separate the mentor and mentee forever. Hemingway would become one of the greatest American writers, writing such works as Farewell to Arms, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and the aforementioned A Movable Feast. He would never forget Paris, a city cut out of dreams, yet, while some dreamed, others hoped. Violet Morris had dreams. She dreamed of being in the Olympics, becoming a boxer, wrestler, a race car driver. Morris received Morris achieved most of these dreams, except for one. That one would propel her to make a decision that would ultimately cost her her life. Welcome to Wicked Duel. Violet Morris was born to Baron Pierre Jacques Maurice, a retired French Army cavalry captain, and Elizabeth Marie Antoinette Sakakini, of Palestinian origin. She married Cyprian Edward Joseph Gerald on August 22, 1914. Morris was different. She dressed in men's attire, was a heavy smoker, and swore often. She had divorced her husband in 1923 and began frequenting a club called La Monaco. La Monaco opened its doors in the 1920s by a mysterious figure who preferred short hair and men's clothing. Simply known to her patrons as Lulu, Lulu was friends to many. One included George Brousset, who was the only male photographer permitted to photograph inside Le Monaco. One of his subjects was Violet Morris. There's a photograph in his later published book, The Secret Paris of the 1930s, where Morris sits nestled next to her girlfriend. Yes, I said girlfriend because the truth was Morris was gay and not so hidden secret. Her personal life cost her many things, as well as the decision from the French Women's Sports Federation as to have her banned from the 1928 Olympics, citing her love of dressing in men's clothing as immoral. This decision will eventually cost her life. And not to jump ahead, let's highlight other reasons she was banned from the Olympics. She punched a football referee and was accused of giving other players amphetamine. Yet discrimination was apparent as the same year Morris, an avid racer, license was revoked over the grounds of having immoral behavior. Everything that Morris loved was slowly taken away. Yet Morris, being a natural born fighter, was not going to give up easily. She unsuccessfully sued the French Women's Sports Federation for damages, but once again did not go away quietly. A quote was attributed to Morris, but was censored. Quote, we live in a country made rotten by money and scandals, ruled by speechifiers, schemers, and cowards. This country of little people is not worthy of survival. Someday's decay will bring it to the level of a slave, 
But if I'm still here, I won't be one of those slaves. Believe me, it's not in my temperament. End quote. After all of this, you would think life would get a little easier for Morris, but that was not the case. On Christmas Eve, 1927, while having dinner with friends and neighbors, Robert and Simon de Trobriand at a restaurant in Newley, the trio encounter a drunk and aggressive young man named Joseph Lacan. The unemployed ex-legionnaire began embroiled in a heated argument with Simone de Trobriand. Morris was able to call the man after some time. The following evening, after some drinking in Mamont, the calm arrived at Morris's houseboat and another argument took place, this time between Morris and Lacan. Lacan left the houseboat but soon returned after seeing Simone de Troubillon, with whom he had been arguing the night before, boarding La Mouette. Lacan then rushed back to the houseboat, brandishing a knife and threatening both Morris and de Troubillon. Morris pushed Lacan several times while he lunged at her and she produced a revolver. Morris fired four shots, the first two into the air, the following two at Lacan. He would later die in the hospital. Morris was arrested and charged with homicide and incarcerated for four days at La Petite Roquette Prison in the 11th arrondissement of Paris. She was tried in the Cour d'Assises in March 1938 and was acquitted when the court accepted her plea of self-defense. The rejection by the French Women's Sports Federation decision to not let her compete in the 1928 Olympics still festered with Morris. Their choice created a strong dislike to the French government. By the end of December 1935, the Nazis had finally recruited her into the SS with a code name, Hyena. Adolf Hitler invited her to attend the 1936 Berlin Olympics as his personal guest. Morris would eventually be responsible for turning over the plans to the Germans for the French Maginot Line, strategic parts of Paris, and to engineering plans for the French tank known as the Samoa S-35. All of this contributed significantly to the success of the German invasion of France, and in particular, Paris. During the occupation years, Violet partnered with the Bonnie, the French Gestapo, and participated in the tortures, primarily women prisoners and executions of members of the French resistance. She was also responsible for infiltrating and arresting members of the British dead teams with a special operations executive. Violet's collaborations with the Nazis was well known around town. By 1944, the French resistance had had enough of Violet Morris. On April 26, 1944, while driving in a car with fellow collaborators, Violet and all of her party, including two children, were gunned down outside Paris by the French resistance. Her body went unclaimed and her remains were thrown into a communal grave. I'm not sure if the pit was ever marked. While speculative, I would imagine had she not been killed in April, Father would have been one of the first to be arrested shortly after liberation and quickly executed without trial by the French partisans. Louis kept La Monaco going through the jazz age of the 20s and the hard times of depression to the 1930s. Yet the club's end came when Hitler's troops marched into Paris on June 14, 1940. They brought with them not only soldiers, tanks, and guns, they brought hate. The rulers of German occupied Paris, stifled the arts, and persecuted people deemed inferior. Homosexuals were a prime target for the Nazi onslaught. Soldiers and collaborating Paris police rounded up lesbians and gay men and sent them off to the horrors of the concentration camp. Lulu, through sheer grit and the determination to provide lesbians with what we would call today a safe place, kept the doors of La Monica open for a while. But early in the decades of the 1940s, this safe space was safe no longer. The Monaco like dreams had come to an end, and Lulu, as mysterious as she arrived on the left bank of Paris, disappeared. According to Brazé, she relocated to Montmartre, Rue Pigalle. The world had changed and Paris, with all its glory and inhibition, changed with it. The lost generation, coined by a lesbian, was loathed by the world people like her created. If you look for old photos of La Monaco, you won't find many, yet it existed. It was a place dreamed by Lulu, a place to laugh, to loathe, to love freely. Hemingway reminisced of Paris as a party, but the party was for the few. Violet Morris illustrated the uninvited. What Morris did was wrong. It was cruel and it was selfish. It was cowardly. But the world as I can imagine her eyes wronged her first. 
La Monaco as Morris knew it no longer exists. The building still stands but a mere shadow. Very few things are left of this hidden city. The underbelly that Brzee loved to photograph. The outcast. The unloved. The tarnished glint of Paris. Yet I believe Hemingway said the best of this place, of this time, of Paris. So I would end as I started with words on a lot. When spring came, even the fall spring, there were no problems except where to be happiest. The only thing that could spoil a day was the people. And if you could keep from making engagements, each day had no limits. People were always the limiters of happiness, except for the very few that were as good as spring itself.